Hello everyone and welcome to today's session, Using Real World Content for Effective Reading. My name is Tracy Bailey and I work with National Geographic Learning. I'd like to start with some fun, so let's try out some visual puzzles. I have a question for you, and just so you know, all the examples I'm showing you today come from Reading Explorer 3rd Edition. So my question to you is, are the lines straight? If you answered yes, you would be correct. The lines are straight. The little circles in the squares affect our view of the picture, so we think they're curved. Just to give you another example, here I've put a triangle around, so you can say again, the lines are straight, even though their eyes make them think they look curved. All right, let's try another one. How about this one? Is one square darker than the other? So look at one and two, or are they the same? think you might have guessed yes squares one and two are actually the same color the reason that our eyes are tricked is that the apple shadow makes our brain think that square two is lighter than it really is so why am I showing these to you we're talking about effective reading as many of you've guessed these are optical illusions so our eyes make mistakes and get confused the same can also go with reading the challenge for for language learners is the need to comprehend of course what they read while determining its reliability. Today we'll look at how Reading Explorer uses National Geographic content to build effective reading and vocabulary strategies, critical thinking skills, and new literacies to help learners navigate the information age. So, first and foremost, you need readings that are about real people. So students can go, so students can go to the internet and search them. They can look these people up or they can look up the stories that they're looking at. Let me ask you, do you know who this is? Yeah, this is Alex Hunold. For those of you who don't know who he is, he was the first free climber, no ropes, to climb El Capitan in Yosemite, California. It's just quite a feat. It's about real places. So students can see different places around the world, maybe some places where they're from or where they would like to visit someday. And then finally, for motivation, there are real stories. Here's a reading by, about doc, Dr. Richard Brenner, who's also an expert on illnesses. So again, as we've mentioned, um, this is something that is very prevalent in the news right now, and it's interesting and motivating for students. And it's affecting them. So through the rest of the session today, I'm gonna go through these four buckets, reading, vocabulary, infographics, and video. So why do you read or why do I read? Um, some reasons would be for information, enjoyment, escape, news, knowledge, communication. The authentic reading experience is about reading for a purpose. So when we're asking our students to read, there should be some purpose. Ideally, some combination of the reasons we just stated above, which is why we use National Geographic readings from National Geographic Magazine, because they're current, they're interesting, they're usually important and motivating for students. So the first step is really getting students interested in reading or motivated. So we've asked the question, how do you improve reading? Well, here's what we found so far, is you wanna meet the students where they're at. So you, like I said earlier, you wanna have real life themes, so for example, here you'd have something on backyard discoveries, which is on biology and ecology, high-tech solutions, so technology, finding wonders, archaeology, the plastic planet, where we're talking about the environment, identity, um, where we're talking about sociology, psychology. And just so you know, these first last two I just showed you were on the cover of National Geographic magazine. These were the covers. And then finally, um, fact or fake. So again, on psychology and uh, the idea of whether something is true or false, or we're being tricked like that optical illusion. So again, here, um, I'm going to go to this fact or fake unit is oftentimes we want to have students be able to see themselves. And I think here there's a reading we're going to see that's the limits of lying and why we lie. And I think this would be an interest of all students because uh, we're all interested in why people tell tales. 
Um, one way or one other way to make a text relatable is to include personal aspects. People generally like reading about people rather than just things as they're easier to relate to. So, so again, when we go back to this limits of lying, it's talking about why people do what they do. And then finally, as we go through, and this is kind of one I'm gonna keep threading through, is that we wanna have some kind of mystery or at least a question that needs answering. So again, it's that idea of the information gap and have students thinking. Um, again, we wanna have that mystery or question that students are striving for. It tends to make them motivated and make them wanna persevere and keep reading. But also, you know, finally, many of you may do is you may wanna take a survey at the beginning of the semester and find out what types of reading students are interested in. So, back to that idea of mystery, or at least a question that needs answering. Lying is part of human nature, but how far will people go? This is the question that's being asked. It will give us students a reason to read and, and make them curious. It's human nature to wanna to know what's inside a mystery box or the answer to a puzzle or how an optical illusion works that we talked about earlier. So here we have a read on the limits of lying. Here I just wanted to let you know that this uh, page is coming from our classroom presentation tool, which you can use online or in classroom, and it shows all student pages, audio and video, all in one place. So how far will people go when they lie? Well, you're gonna have to do the reading and find out about it. Next, I wanna keep in the same unit and I wanna do something here. I wanna do a riddle. I'm trying to get you to do a few things since um, we're not in real time together. I have a riddle for you. Um, here's the riddle. A bat and a ball cost $1.10 in total. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Okay, if many of you said 10 cents, you're not alone. Most people give the same answer. The correct answer, of course, is five cents. It's an example of how often we rely on intuitive responses, answers we feel are true. People give answers that pop into their minds, says cognitive science, Steve Sloman. We don't spend much time reflecting and checking whether the answer is right or wrong. So again, tying in with this today's theme, this idea of, of reading, being an effective reader, but also being able to take the time to slow down, or we say slow thinking, and think about whether the facts we're reading are true or false. And again, like we said, there's a real person, Stephen Sloman, and again, students can do further research. He's on the internet and he's easily found. Of course, when we're doing reading, it's important again to, to kind of get that idea of going, of building critical thinking skills, but you know, we also want them to um, strengthen their reading skills, right? The reading lists, like here I have gist, vocabulary, purpose, detail, influence. We could do reading for main ideas. We can do skimming and scanning um, and so many, many others that are always in this series. But we also, what you're gonna find here is that we really, really wanna work on those critical thinking skills and especially have students really evaluating statements. So for example, here, I also took this from the classroom presentation tool. Again, here you can project anything from the book and how the students, and you can also give the students the answers. So here is an example of an activity that students are asked to evaluate statements, whether they're true, false, or it's not given, they have no idea. Or you're gonna see that, like I said, a lot of analyzing here. So analyzing reasons, you're gonna see. Analyzing reasons, sorry. Analyzing claims. And again, evaluating evidence, or for example, evaluating ideas. So really here, one of the key features is that we want students to build their reading skills, of course, but we also want them to become much more critical readers and think about what they're reading, not just the words on the page, but putting all the words together and what they suggest. So, that said, let's go to number two, vocabulary. There are many ways to improve vocabulary, but in this session, I'm gonna just focus on several areas. The first and most obvious is, of course,
provide practice of target vocabulary. Um, and this seems like a no brainer, but again, this is here in the series, the vocabulary is very carefully thought out. And again, there are gonna be activities that students are gonna do completion tasks, definition tasks, word and contest tasks, and extension tasks. That's a lot of tasks. So when you have students doing this practice of target vocabulary, there's one suggestion that it's, it comes up and it is kind of a through line in this series is, we suggest that students don't check target vocabulary in the dictionary while they're reading. Again, with that idea of the mystery or an information gap, it's better to have students look back at the main reading passage, look at the word in context, identify its part of speech, and try to guess the meaning. Again, it's doing that information gap. It's getting the brain to work harder, and it will help get things into long-term memory. And second, then have students complete activities where they're actually gonna uncover what the meaning is, and then finally, of course, have them use their dictionaries or do translation um, as a final practice. With that said, and we're also talking about here and decoding things and not having students just read word by word by word and not putting words together, um, what you're gonna find in this series as well is there is a lot of strong work with collocations. These are words that typically go together. So again, it's giving students the vocabulary that they need to start unpacking the meaning in the readings. And then of course, as we've talked about with the information gap, it's also important for students to work on word forms. Is it a noun? Is it a verb? Is it an adjective? Or is it an adverb? And again, this helps them start to be able to be a decoder or a mystery, to solve the mystery puzzle of vocabulary in English. And then finally, and there are many, many other vocabulary things we can do with vocabulary, but finally, um, the most important is repetition and recycling. Studies suggest a learner needs to encounter a word at least seven times. It could be up to 10 to 12 times before it goes into their long-term memory. And also distributed practice is important. And what I mean by this, it's recycling vocabulary over a sequence of lessons in spaced intervals. So learning some vocabulary, walking away, and walking back to it again. So what you're gonna see here in, in level two is the vocabulary word, the target word was continued. And it says she continued. And also you're gonna find in this same reading, life continues to insp inspire visitors. So they're seeing the word twice. We're gonna to go to another reading and it says if global, if global warming continues, sorry. We're also gonna to get to another reading where it says Marco continued his. And again, revisiting a couple units later, our brains continue to change. This is a reading on the teenage brain. And here we're gonna find it continue comes back in yet another unit where we're talking about Antarctica and if the ice sheet continues to melt. And then finally, he continued on his way. Again, this is from the limits of lying. And then again, another reading in unit 12, the dream of flight. You're gonna say, yet many continued to dream of flying. And then again, you're gonna see continued shows up in this reading again. So it's that idea of having recycled, recycled vocabulary and spaced out. So again, giving students time to digest and come back and really get these keywords into their long-term memories. And here you go. So you wanna provide multiple exposures to keywords, of course. So here it's in the readings themselves, but there are other ways we can do it. And you also have digital tools that give learners more practice. Again, I've talked about the classroom presentation tool, which you can use online or in person. Um, and here you're gonna find that there's always a vocabulary quiz, again, so extra practice for the students to do. And um, there's also an online practice that can be self-study or it can also be used as a grade book as a teacher. And again, it takes that target vocabulary and gives them more activities, again, to practice online. And then finally, there's a teacher's resource site that has more vocabulary practice here. It's always some type of vocabulary crossword. So again, getting students to review that vocabulary and get it into their long-term memories. And then finally, we wanna talk about production skills. So there are also communicative activities in every unit for vocabulary. So here we'll have students either speaking or writing or producing the language, again, helping get it into their long-term memories. So we've done reading briefly. We've now talked about vocabulary. And now I would like to go to infographics. So my question here is what is an infographic? 
infographics, I'll give you a second to read this. Yeah, infographics are important in the 21st century. Um, students and readers need to draw on multiple skills now, visual literacy, numeracy, text literacy, critical thinking, especially synthesis, analysis, and summary and evaluating. It's an incredible rich resource for language. And as you're going to see now, we're finding that students aren't reading just linearly, linearly right now. Sorry, that's a hard word for me to get out. They're often jumping all over a page. The text isn't just going from top to bottom or right to left. Again, they're looking here and they may be looking at an image. So with infographics, there's several things that you're going to find. They, you want to have visual interest. You want them to be thematically aligned. You want depth and dimension. Um, you want to have a unique concept. And you want them to be true. With this said, I'm going to kind of trick you a little bit and, and work on this one for true. And I think a lot of that uncovering the mystery box, what's in the mystery box of the puzzle, is making sure that when you're looking at infographics, you can check their reliability. So here, I have one, you know, we're going to find infographics everywhere. Um, we're going to find them in for success in college, in careers, in daily life. We, we live in a data rich world with graphics popping up on everything from advertising to political campaigns to even household bills. So being a confident consumer of that visual literacy or visual information is very, very crucial. So I want to start with one here for you from Microsoft. Here, I want you to look at this infographic from 2011 to 2014. And there's a, a bit of an issue with this, with this infographic, if you look at it. So I'm going to give you about 10 seconds. Something isn't quite right. Yeah, so if you've looked and had a second to look here, what you're going to see is from 2011 to 2014, um, we're going to find that, the, you know, we've, they've, Microsoft has increased their philanthropy to schools and nonprofits, but the visual is misleading because it, the 100, it's gone up 17 million in four years, which is fantastic. But why have they put so many more people on top? They've like made it look like they've doubled what they did from 2011, when really they've only gone up. 17 million. So again, that idea of this new literacy and being able to unpack information in visual form to make informed decisions. So here I'm going to do another one with you here. Um, this is, is from a National, Mag National Geographic magazine. And this is an interesting visual. It's even kind of pretty if you look at it. So let me give you a few seconds and I ask you, what do you think this infographic is about? What questions do you have about the graphic, the colors, the stars, why some circles are filled and others are not filled, why there are some countries here and some countries aren't here? So just take a minute. Yeah, what do you think this is about? What do you think of the colors and stars and circles filled and not filled? But again, with this infographic, you can look at it visually. You can start making guesses again, that, that mystery element. You could do this with your class. Um, it's also just having students predict and think about what this infographic is going to be about. But you, you need a little more information. So let me give you the title. The title of this infographic is Soccer Without Borders. So what is this infographic deciding? Um, what if I give you a little more information that's also in this infographic, the key, that you can start looking at the arrows and the circles and not circles. And as you unpack it, you'll find that it's more interesting and motivating. So I want you to think about what is the idea that this reading you're going to do after this infographic is communicating. Of course, we're not going to do the reading today. So if you want to take the time, you can find it in the National Geographic magazine or also in Reading Explorer. You can also, like we said, it's searchable, it's Googleable. So again, you can also look it up. And this is a topic on which World Cup teams have the most foreign born players. That's what the reading is going to be about. So again, that idea, the novelty, the mystery, having students have that information gap, and also highly interesting, uh, football and soccer is, is the biggest sport globally. 
And then finally, I just wanted to show a few more infographics so you get an idea where you have text that's being supported by an infographic. And these infographics can do things like they're showing classifications, they could be showing uh, timelines, uh, they could be showing processes, here it's earthquakes, and so on. Here it's studying King Tut's tomb. So infographics with text or linear text is very important in this day and age. Students are much more visual learners and they have things coming at them visually much, much more often. Okay, so we've done reading, we did vocabulary, and now we want to go to video. And with the time today, I thought it would be very meta for me to do a video and then do a video of a video. So what I'd like to do for the last one is I'd like to take you over another way to make students <clears throat> more discerning readers, and that would be with video. And the beauty of why does video matter is it does help students expand topics. Um, it helps them become effective in discerning readers. Uh, I started with a puzzle at the beginning <clears throat> of this session, and I will I want to end with a couple more puzzles or videos that you can see in Reading Explorer or find online. And basically reading, again, we talk about these new literacies. Video is another way that students are collecting information. Anyone who has a, a young child or a teen or even older, millennial, knows that they get a lot of their information via video. So we talk about YouTube, uh, TikTok, Khan Academy, if we're going to be highbrow, but video is everywhere and we're exposed to it and, and, and again, discerning information from it. So here I'm going to kind of end with you on a couple more. Here's a video that fact or fake unit we talked about earlier and here is um, a video that you're going to watch. It's called the smile trial and I'm going to ask you um, can you tell which of these smiles is real and which one is fake or not real? Oh, sorry. Yes, the one on the left is fake. So again, here, if you're interested in finding out how you can tell if a smile is fact or fake, um, fake or real, you can go and find out it from real world video. Again, this gives students, again, with that unit, the limits of lying and so forth, and the knowledge of illusion, more information to kind of start thinking about a topic and doing more with it. And then finally, this is one I like very much. It's called the Mozart effect. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Mozart effect. Dr. Jim Cohn is from the University of Virginia, and that's Jim Cohn, C-O-A-N. And he asked, asked himself a question, or there was this concept that the question was, can classical music make you smarter and raise IQs? That was his question. And what do you think? Yes or no? Well, again, I'm going to tease you a little bit and have you go. You can find him. Look up Dr. Jim Cohn. COAN at University of Virginia, and you can find out more about his studies. But also here when we're talking about video and becoming effective readers, um, looking at reliability and also expanding our language, um, it gives students an, an opportunity to hear vocabulary. It just comes off the page for them as well. So it gives them another multimodal way to learn. And then also like you're going to see here, there is cr critical thinking. And here again, it's an evaluating a method. So after the students watch the video, they're asked, do you think this was a really good way to do research or what would you recommend that could make Dr. Cohn's methods better? So again, taking that extra gap, having work on the mystery puzzle or ask a question like, well, I don't know if I believe it. I don't trust the research or not. So just so you know, and especially in this time as we're, many teachers are transitioning from, um, in-person classrooms to digital. There are a lot of digital offerings here. There's a classroom presentation tool, which I showed you some examples of earlier, um, where you have all the student book pages, audio and video. Um, you can put that if you're on a Zoom call or however you're doing your online classes or also in class. There is a teacher's companion site, so more materials for you, videos and so forth. There are also eBooks, there's student eBooks. Um, there's DVD and audio CD packages for old school. And then of course, there's an exam view online. And these are all perfect tools to use in person or in the digital environment. Oop, sorry. 
So let me finish today by saying today's session, we really want to go over and look at what makes an effective reader. And first and foremost, we talked about reading, of course, reading skills, building vocabulary, um, working on new literacies such as infographics and how you digest and decipher um, visual information, and then also video, uh, other ways to, to gain information and improve your reading. So the challenge that we started with for language learners is the need to comprehend what they read while determining its reliability. And I think Reading Explorer helps students build these skills with effective reading and vocabulary. It helps them with new literacies, and it does help them think about what they're looking at and navigate the information age, as all of us are. So having thought-provoking readings, we make students curious, for one, motivated, interesting, and give them the tools that they need to decide on the veracity or reliability of, our, of what they're reading and what they're looking at out in the world today. So with that said, I'd like to thank you all for attending. I hope you have a great few more sessions or how many sessions you can go to. And please reach out to us if you have any questions. And I thank you for your time and have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thank you.